Hello and welcome to the Majlis, the weekly podcast by Ready Free Europe Radio Liberty, focusing on Central Asia. I'm Mohammed Tahir, Ready Free Europe Radio Liberty's media manager for South and Central Asia here in Washington, D.C. Following the resignation of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, a lot is happening in Kazakhstan. On one hand, the country is preparing to elect its second leader since the independence. On the other hand, despite the crackdown, a growing number of people are taking streets in protest. What's that that they are angry about? What does the timing tell us and where things are possibly headed from here? So there is a lot to talk about and to discuss all these. I'm joined by Rit Standish, uh, an Astana-based journalist working for the foreign policy. Leila Zulikha Mahmudova, a political activist, gender and education consultant based in Almaty. Bruce Fanier, the editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlok Awazi. And Bruce is joining us from Prague. Welcome on board, colleagues. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Hi. Very nice to have you. Yeah. Um, okay, so Reid, let's start with you and with today's events. So what, what has been happening where you are? Yeah, well, you know, I'm up here in Nur Sultan where things were a little more quiet today. But there there were protests again down in Almaty. Um, again, a series um, of arrests of uh, protesters. Um, and we also saw um, a bunch of news sites get banned today. You know, amongst others, uh, you know, Vlast, uh, The Village, Polar News. And I think this shows that uh, as the election is getting closer, the June 9th election, you know, the authorities are starting to maybe get a little bit worried about the amount of uh, momentum that's starting to be gained of people coming out onto the streets. Yeah, authorities seems to be worried, but activists are also angry for some reason. Uh, Leila, you are among them. Tell us uh, what you have been doing today. So actually, t- today I was not in the streets mm. because I had my uh, human rights course. <laughs> mm. ah. But uh, the thing is that my friends were in the meetings mm-hmm. today, and um, some of them, they reported that like five to six thousand people were marching. Uh, in different parts, and uh, all of them were again gathering just to protest the current situation. Hmm. Okay, Bruce, yeah. so looking into this from abroad, what do you see is happening? Well, clearly there's a lot of a lot of uh, dissatisfaction with the upcoming elections and the fact that you know, there are people out there that don't really feel there's much of a choice for them anymore, that the, the whole uh, transfer of power has already been agreed to at the top uh, among the elites and that there's, you know, even though they're going to hold an election exactly one month from today, it, it seems to be fairly meaningless. And so, you know, people are coming out and it, there's some, some clever uh, protest actions going on here, you know. I mean, we've seen a lot of the stuff on the streets, but uh, some of the other things that are uh, that people have been doing, statements that are put on signs or or, or not put on signs, uh, have actually taken on uh, some or presented some serious political challenges for the Kazakh authorities, which they have not risen to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd have to say. I mean, they, they seem to be taken by surprise by the actions that are that are continue e- despite warnings, but the. The methods, the inventiveness of some of these people, oh, yeah. I think, has also taken the authorities by surprise. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We, we would like to talk about that more. Leila, uh, before that, it is kind of coming together, like these protests and the elections. But what's that you guys really want? First of all, we want uh, to like send message to not to the government, but to the people about uh, the elections, that we should be active in forthcoming elections and we should do everything to show that we are here and we have a choice so uh, actually the campaign and uh, uh, like these methods that we uh, use like uh, currently they are really different uh, from the things that were of course uh, like in the past and I think that uh, even this like a uh, hashtag activism that became really widespread in the activism that we have now, like hashtags among them is I have a choice, or you cannot run away from the truth for like rightful elections. Those hashtags are really widespread across the Internet now. And uh, it all started in Marathon which was in uh, April 21st in Almaty. It was uh, like a city, uh, annual city marathon and several activists, they showed the banner uh, with the slogan, you cannot run away from the truth in Russian. Yeah. And uh, two hashtags like um, I have a choice and uh, in Russian and Kazakh. And from that time on, uh, like everything, I, I guess, really actively started. 
and um, first of all, the thing is that like activists were detained by the police, and like uh, there was um, like uh, the prosecution, uh, which was really like not rightful, mm. and uh, we all felt that even in this very like um, when we show our opinion in a very say mild manner. Mm just showing the banner, mm. we can not be uh, abused from the government's mm. power. Mm. And uh, that's why we should be even more active in order to support at least ourselves and uh, to, to show that if you have no interest in our opinion, then it means maybe we didn't show it in a popular manner before. So now we, can, we should do it. So the forthcoming elections, they will not be the same as they were like 30 years in a row by now, mm -hmm. when nothing was uh, clear and transparent. But hmm. everything was very usual scenario yeah. when we already knew what will be the result. Yeah. And yeah. there were, of course, lots of sarcasm about uh, why should we spend this you know, budget money on those elections, or all those campaigns, mm -hmm. when we already know what, yeah, what will be the result yeah. of, the, of the campaign mm -hmm. and of the elections. Yeah. K kind of curious, uh, this banner, which was kind of the starting point of all this, what was that about? Yeah, you can't run away from the truth. W what does that mean? So, uh, you know, there's like a um, very interesting slogan, I would say, yeah. uh, because um, the activists that thought up this slogan, they were very inventive, I guess, because uh, well, this banner was placed on marathon, right? Mm. So the people were running. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, literally running. And uh, they were running by this banner and oh. they saw this slogan. You cannot run away from the truth. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, to like hashtag is I have a choice. Mm -hmm. So it was about action that is happening mm. on that day, like running. Oh. Mm, but at the same time, it was about the situation, like uh, in country as a whole, that like the elections are coming, and we all know what it is happening to be. Mm. And um, but we are still uh, like. Um, being ignorant to this, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, like trying to, I don't know, be active in marathon, in other events, be very, I don't know, maybe to have other types of fun, mm. but not facing the truth mm -hmm. that like elections are mm, coming and okay. we don't have a choice in those elections. Yeah, I can see uh, you guys are prepared this time, Leila. Let's see where we are headed with this. So, Reid, what is your understanding of what's happening? I hear kind of mixed messages coming out from this entire uh, protests. Uh, like, you know, people are talking about the elections, about the transparency, about the truth, about unemployment, you name it. What's that that really they want? What well, do we I, want? No, let, let's let's <laughs> let's let's take a read this point on this. Yeah, I, I, I'd say you know from what I'm understanding is you're right. It is a very broad message, and it is, but that's because it, you know in order to get enough people under one umbrella, you have to bring in people from all different sorts of walks of life. But I think that people are united under you know one sort of message, which is you know to have an actual free and fair election, which is something that's never actually happened in Kazakhstan uh -huh. before. And so I'd say that's sort of the broad thing. But I'd say what, what also stands out right now at this moment compared to past times is, you know, a lot of these protests are, they're a lot more sophisticated. They're certainly more social media savvy. Hmm. They know how to get resonance, you know, not only within the, the country, but also internationally, which also goes a long way in terms of putting pressure on the government because the Kazakh government does care a lot about what is being said about it in the world. It's also, it's, it's very, very self-conscious of its image around the world. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting moment, I think, right now, because you have this contrast of, this, you know, the young generation of Kazakhs, you know, these are the people who the only generation to grow up in an independent Kazakhstan. They don't have that same sort of baggage tied to the Soviet legacy as mm. other people in the country do. Um, and so you contrast that generation, which has a very different outlook on the world and grew up in a Kazakhstan of, you know, rising wages, rising living conditions, and people's expectations have been raised. And now they expect more. They expect, okay, it's not just enough to say, you're the government, you can give us a livelihood, 
and that's enough. No, we want a choice. We want to have a say mm -hmm. in the direction of our country. Um, and so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens, especially as now we're going through this transition of, I mean, I guess in a lot of ways, Nazarbayev is still calling the shots. He's still the man in charge of lots of, of pretty much everything. I mean, he's, his title is, is pretty large. Um, but as we start to see this transition into Takayev, who is someone who, you know, his power still flows through Nazarbayev, right. but he doesn't really have the kind of personal legitimacy that Nazarbayev has as this founding father and, you know, leader of the nation type figure. And, you know, Kazakhstan doesn't really have institutions that you can fall back on. So what kind of legitimacy does Takayev really have moving forward? Um, you know, especially as these you know, calls for protests get louder from the people. Hmm. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how these two kind of uh, forces collide. Yeah. And also Bruce Reed was talking about this broad umbrella, uh, which brings all these people together. So what's the scope and size of this activity? Uh, like how many people are, are we talking about and what are the cities these protests are taking place in? And also, what does this tell you? I think it's impossible to to put a number on how many people yeah. are involved in this but certainly it's it's widespread and this is something of course which is going to concern the Kazakh authorities uh, immensely is because mm. this, it might be centered in the big cities of the east in, in Nur Sultan and, and Almaty but uh, you know both on May 1st and today there were reports coming in from Shimkant and Oktobe mm. and places like that so I mean it's spread really around the country it might not be as, as large or dynamic uh, but but it's certainly widespread in terms of Kazakhstan even though the numbers might not be huge huh. um, no is there there you know I mean Reed made a good point there's a there's a lot of different interests at work here so how, how do you get all these people behind one one or two issues and and get them to unify it that's you know that's going to be tough there are some social issues things like that that I suppose you could uh, people can latch on to and 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 add their own grievances on the side, but keeping focused on two or three things. I would mention, though, that I think a lot of this is because, okay, when Nazarbayev resigned, at the, you know, in March, there was obviously this was a shock for a lot of people. Huh. Um, but in transitions that we've seen in, in other Central Asian countries, there's the expectation that that the new leadership means that it, that there's going to be some kind of change. Uh, in the country. And, and you know, with Nazarbayev still alive and still having really all the power and, and Takayev repeating again and again that he's going to hold to Nazarbayev's path, we have a change of leadership which doesn't represent any kind of ch change of course or any hope for a change of course. Yeah. And I think this is proving to be the problem in Kazakhstan is that people are, are like, it's not so much that they're against new leadership, but they want to know that the leadership is going to do something different that's going to improve their lives. So you are saying is like indirectly still Nazarbayev a factor in what's happening today in terms of these protests? Oh, absolutely. I don't yeah. think anyone's fooled that he's running the country. Uh, you know, I mean, constitutionally, he absolutely is running the country and mm -hmm. will be until he dies. Uh, you know, so, you know, this, this election, and let's remember, too, that this election was called rather hastily. There wasn't really a need for this. They could have let this go until the presidential term expired next year and done it, too. Uh, but for some reason, they decided they were going to have to do this, you know, in, on June 9th, uh, two and a half months after Nazarbayev had stepped down from power. It's, it's sending all the wrong messages to the people that, that you know, things are, are not going to change at all, except for the person that calls himself the president. That's the only thing that's going to change. But in fact, he's not even the one in power. And all the policies that are in place mm -hmm. today are still going to be in place after June 9th. Leila, it's not the first time that, that something like this is happening in terms of uh, protests. But this time, you guys are proving resilient and are sticking together. How this all organization is, is coming about? Like, uh, you know, you have this uh, protest in Almaty going on, and some people are coming out in Nur Sultan and some other cities that Bruce mentioned. How this entire organization works? Like, are you guys connected to each other? I mean, what I'm saying is, is there any organization behind it? So, no, no organization behind it. Like in the in the activism that uh, we have now, mm. in in the like uh, uh, activism that is under, let's say, umbrella of those hashtags, mm. like I, you cannot run away from the truth or you have a choice. Those uh, like people who are actively like involved in the situation, they go to the meetings, they go to the courts, they uh, actively present their ideas in their uh, social media, they want to speak up. Those people, the number is organically evolving and there is no 
formal institutions or organizations that are gathering these people under the umbrella, let's say, mm. of this hashtag. So, and uh, I think that, let's say, in this, all the activism that we have now, I can see two groups of people. Mm. The first group, the group of, like, uh, which is... Um, I'm involved in uh, and they, as I said like mostly we are young activists and uh, we uh, want just um, what we really like um, thriving for this is the choice like we want choice we want this power to govern the country as citizens you know to like uh, to have this choice in elections to be able to to vote for our president, for local leaders, for anyone who can be like elected. So this is the thing that we want. But there is another group of uh, people who are also actively involved in the meetings and other things. And uh, this uh, group of people are led by a leader, Muhtar Ablazov, mm. who is um, actively opposite to the a current government right. and um, he escaped the country like uh, many years ago uh -huh. and now he cannot come back to the country because here uh, he will be detained and prosecuted uh -huh. and um, he uh, is blamed for his corruption in the country yeah. uh, and he is actively gathering people through internet channels mm. like messengers social media and uh, he even uh, formed his political party like online one and um, he is uh, really actively shaking moods of people mm. and trying to gather people opposite to the government and uh, trying to seduce them with in my opinion very unrealistic promises you know to change the country and to make it really different and uh, all the people who are in the first group, like uh, those young activists, mm. we do not want to be involved with the things that this political party do, mm. with Mukhtar Ablazov and everything that he is doing, because we do not trust this person, we do not trust all the promises he makes, and uh, we really believe that he's a corrupt one, and he just needs the power, and that's it. So, uh, and um, Mukhtar Ablazov was claiming that several activists from the I Have a Choice campaign are his colleagues hmm. or protégés, you know, that he's connected to them, but he's not. He was lying. So, and uh, those people, those activists, friends of mine, they were like reporting back mm. on their social media that they are not connected with this political party and Mukhtar Ablazov anyways. Mm. And we don't want to be associated with this person anyhow. Mm. Mm. So no, it's an, it's an important clarification. Important. Yeah, important clarification, Leila. So um, if I ask you to name a leader for what's happening in today's Kazakhstan in terms of the protesters, who that person would be? Is, is there any leader? There is no like clear one leader who is hmm. formally or somehow, I don't know, uh, in any official terms named himself or uh, other people name this, this person a leader. But I think that it is just essential to understand, like to know that like people like Asia Tulesova and Vibarus Tolumbekov, uh, hmm. who were detained for showing this banner, Mm. Uh, you cannot run away from the truth in marathon and started all the things are like leaders for many people like for us first of all for activists and uh, for those people who maybe they were not that much interested in the politics and in elections but after this situation they became more active mm. and they were inspired by this action that's why, like, the inspirers and the leaders of the campaign and of the uh, activism, I guess in many ways, the, like Asia and uh, Vibaras. But also I can name that uh, they, there are other people who were detained in May 1st in the meeting. And uh, most of them are in Astana too, not only in Almaty. Asya and Bibaris are from Almaty. And uh, those people in Astana, I guess, uh, like uh, Alimjan Basarov and others, became inspirers for their local communities mm. and okay. for like wider people. Mm. So, and uh, I guess the thing is that with this campaign or with this activism, there is no need for one leader. 
I guess, um, as Aisa said in her uh, yesterday's uh, interview to one of the news portals, that we now need activism or movements where there are lots of leaders in for their communities, for their cities, mm-hmm. uh, for their organizations mm-hmm. that could have, maybe we all have the same idea, but we're like a very various and there are lots of us. Mm-hmm. So if something happens to one of us, the others can continue the work, you know, mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. is the thing. Mm-hmm. Bruce, you were earlier talking about the this creative ideas that the protesters are coming out to irritate the authorities, I believe. By now, we all know the man uh, who was dragged by police for holding a blank paper. And now you have a new trend. Uh, people are protesting, pretending to be holding signs and are uh, being uh, arrested for uh, doing so. So uh, Kazakhstan has occasionally, Bruce, uh, seen protests like this. But what's there to, to say about the way authorities are handling this? Well, they're they're handling it extremely poorly. Uh, you know, I mean, it it just looks stupid to arrest somebody for holding a white piece of paper, and it looks even even more stupid when you're arresting someone for for miming holding something. You know, and but so, like I said, it's very clever on the part of the protesters because uh, you know the, everyone understands kind of what they're where they're going with this why they're putting the posting these pictures but then when they're detained uh, there's there's absolutely no basis i mean you know when they detained the guy with the with the just blank piece of paper that he had out there and admittedly he was talking a lot you know it, it would have been more effective if he hadn't have, hadn't have done a monologue <laughs> before it i thought but yeah. You know, they detain him and they bring him down and then find out that they can't really figure out what they're going to charge him with. You know, I mean, what what law, what what violation did he commit by holding a blank piece of paper? You know, and so it makes the authorities look stupid for doing something like this, you know, and even stupider when they have nothing in their hands at all. Uh, You know, so uh, it's very clever on the part of the protesters. If you're following Kazakhstan, you understand what's going on. And it puts the authorities in quite a bind because if they let it go, I suppose they're worried it could spread all over the place. But in the meantime, it it looks ridiculous to to bring people into police headquarters for something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let let me add to this, Muhammad. Yeah. Here is the thing that we were discussing this case with a very blank banner, banner and uh, telling that actually this is like a contemporary art or something, you know, not just activism. So, and uh, the thing is that even with the first banner, which was in the marathon, uh, as I said, the slogan there was, you cannot run away from the truth. But police officer, in his report, he wrote that the slogan was, uh, leader of the nation is a shame of the nation. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and when he was in a jury, he said that this was a technical mistake. <laughs> So that he wrote in this way, because it was obvious that the banner contained other things in it. But uh, when he was asked, why did you write like that the banner contained another slogan? He said, just technical mistake, like technical error. I don't know like what he meant. Mm. And um, it is like happening everywhere that is happening on the jury or, or with police officers that they are doing very gullible mistakes and they are very rude and uh, they of course uh, I guess really understand that they they have the power the amount of which can abuse anyone and they can be okay with this you know because like people were not uh, reacting to this before and now maybe they will not react too Mm. but when we see it like very clear in all of the cases and when we have this power of social media when we can record it and post it at the same time so lots of people can see it i guess now this cannot stay invisible Mm. or they cannot just no longer abuse with their power now we see it it became visible now we really cannot tolerate it anymore Mm. yeah you You know know, if i could just jump in one more because another one that was real powerful was the guy that put the quote from the constitution up there that the people are the sole source of power and was detained yeah. for that. And I'm like, you know, I mean, How they you detained him for, for writing down a passage from their own constitution, you know, which is not threatening in any way. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, and and so it again, it just it makes it makes the situation the authorities look totally ridiculous. Yes, it tells me one thing. It read uh, authorities are clearly confused how to respond to this. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's it's largely the product of. I mean, this is what been thirty years of independent Kazakhstan. There hasn't mm. really been politics, you know, as we even really know it. So how do you you know? It's usually been you deal with dissent with a you know a heavy fist, and you're able to stamp it up. Very tough. So it's. Kind Kind of interesting to see how they're trying to deal with it now because you can tell that they are have limited tools in their toolbox of how to deal with these very creative forms of protest yeah and you know, it's um and they yeah, are it, 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 yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Mom. Yeah, I'm yeah. saying that, you know, one way of they trying to do is, like, they are censoring Internet, I believe, today. Lots of websites being blocked. And, yeah, and- absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting a lot of use of my, my VPN here. You know, even, and it's not just uh, new sites that have been coming under uh, censorship that go offline. Um, you know, I saw some reports of some people u- losing cellular service, their their cell phone carriers, just dropping them for a huge amount of time while they've been out in, in protest areas and sort of targeted zones where you're able to shut off cell access. Hmm. So it is, it, it, it's going to be, be more authoritarian. And that's sort of what I think is a bit of my prediction as the authorities, the only real response they have is to crack down even harder, hmm. which... In a lot of ways, I mean, it's hard not to imagine that backfiring. It's what we've seen happen in other parts of the world where there's been similar pro- protests like this, especially if the crackdowns become more severe, and especially like Lalo said, if they're caught on video and they're able to hmm. spread on social media like wildfire. That's actually how you draw more people to a cause. That's yeah. how you bring out people who normally were just sitting at home watching. That's how hmm. you get them to come out and, uh, and yeah. you know, join this big umbrella. So in a way, it's not a very smart strategy from mm. the Kazakh authorities okay. on this part. Yeah. yeah. Read just a very quick follow-up uh, question, and then we have to move on to, to discuss a little bit about the election process, too. So what's that the, the authorities are really afraid of? I mean, what they are trying to stop from happening? Well, I mean, obviously, I don't know exactly what they're afraid of. I mean, my my personal sort of take and, and what is based off some of the conversation I've had with people who are in government or used to be in government, especially, is, I mean, I think there's not a lot of confidence in the system that's mm. built here. And I think that there's a, there's a fear that it could all come crashing down and the people who are at the top who have benefited from it lose influence, lose power, lose money, things like that. And so that's what I that's that's how I interpret this, you know, very hard response that we're, we've been seeing over the last few years against dissent. And mm. that I think is going to get even harder during this election period and then continue after the election period. But I think it reflects that there that this system is very much something that's been built through Nazarbayev. It is Nazarbayev. And there's a deep seated fear of what happens after him. And no. nobody really knows. Yeah. No one has an answer to that question. Yeah, so, we, are, we are talking about Nazarbayev. One very quick point here. Is, is there anything Nazarbayev is saying about all this? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, not really. I mean, I think he, he's tried to say out of it. I mean, obviously, he, he gave some remarks when he nominated Takayev to be the Nurotan candidate. But, you know, for the most part, I mean, he, he's sort of staying out of the fray. Yeah. I think he, they're trying to proceed, m- move forward as quickly as they can. You know, their goal is to try and establish legitimacy for Takayev and for this whole transition mm. process. And I think that they think that this, these protests, this kind of growing mood in the country, you know, is a storm that they can sail through. Mm-hmm. Um, Leila, very, very, very briefly, um, you know, mm-hmm. with all these uh, creative ideas that you guys are coming up at this time around, so what's next in your, uh, in your toolbox? Where are you headed? So the, the closest date for us is June 9th, yeah. uh, the elections, and we should be really prepared for it, uh, not only by the actions, uh, like uh, by the activism, like events or something, or banners, but we should be... Uh, technically prepared for looking uh, like uh, watching the the elections what does it you know, mean technically prepared what 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 you what you have in mind so uh, the thing is that we know that we are really limited now in the coming elections in our power to vote or in our other rights so but still the thing that we really can do even if we couldn't uh, like manage preparing candidates, mm. uh, which we really want for these elections. Still, we have this power to watch 
the election process. And now many organizations and activists are going to the courses, uh, listening to the courses or teaching how to watch elections, how to watch the process of where citizens vote and uh, all the votes are kept and um, the, the number of vo votes is uh, like shown. So now we want to be part of, of this process and mm. uh, watch how it happens mm -hmm. and uh, to make this process more transparent mm -hmm. uh, and of course uh, to show the real result okay you know <laughs> not mm. not the, the result that someone like Nazarbayev Tokayev or other people in the circle mm. want. okay so this is a really good time to to get into the election uh, discussion so this is what is happening uh, as we speak on the ground as Kazakhstan is preparing for a presidential election so what is happening in the election front. We will continue the discussion talking about this and many other questions very shortly. First, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis podcast. I'm joined by Rich Standish, uh, Nur Sultan-based journalist. I'm still not used to this name. So, uh, yeah, Reid <laughs> Reid works for uh, foreign policy, and Leila Zuleikha Mahmudova, uh, a political activist based in Almaty, and Bruce Panier, editor of uh, Ready Free Europe, Liberty Central Asia blog. Kishlok Owazi Bruce is joining us from Prague, and I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis here in Washington D.C. And we are discussing latest wave of protests in Kazakhstan in the in the light of an upcoming uh, elections. Now. All this is uh, happening at a time when Kazakhstan is preparing for presidential uh, elections, a crucial uh, election, I should say, given the fact that uh, the country is going to elect its second leader since the independence. So, um, Bruce, let me start with you. So what does the timing of all these events tell you? Well, I mean, it's clearly everything that's going on is clearly linked to the election. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And, and you know, one thing we haven't mentioned, although Reid kind of hit on it a little bit, is that there's a lot of international attention on this. So uh, if you've been dis dissatisfied with the way Nazarbayev has been uh, leading the country, or if you're dissatisfied with the way the transition process is going, this is the time to move. Okay. Uh, because, you, you know, that's why, uh, for instance, on May 1st, when these impromptu demonstrations broke out, you know, in, in, in Nur Sultan uh, and Almaty, the police kind of stayed back for a while and let it happen until it had gone on for a couple hours because they don't want the images of people being dragged into vans, beaten with clubs, things like that. You know, it, it, it just makes the country look bad and, and brings into question the legitimacy of Takayev when he finally is elected. So, you know, I mean, the protesters understand this. So do the authorities. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that th This is a chance to get to do this. Yeah, it's also a bad start for Takayev if he indeed gets elected. Is there any, any slightest possibility that, that the result might end up otherwise. No, I don't. I, I really don't see that. I mean, this is so managed that that, that oh, that would be impossible. Uh, you know, the biggest question is what what percentage of the vote is he gonna, is he going to get? Uh, you know, and what percentage of the vote will they allow? Uh, you know, the sole legitimate opposition figure, Amarjan Kosanov, to actually yeah. get to. You know, Takayev will win, but with an overwhelming majority. You know, I, I wouldn't want to put a figure on it, but I mean, we're talking seventy, eighty percent, probably at least. And the rest of the vote will be split between the other six candidates. But it'll be curious to see how much the the sole opposition figure, the, the, at least the only person you could identify as a as a legitimate opposition figure, mm -hmm. would actually get. Uh, will they they try to make sure that his percentage is so low that no one has the idea that there's any popular opposition within the country, and therefore it's it's hopeless to even try to get behind these people? Or will they give him a little bit, you know, five percent or something to show that uh, you know there is an independent voice and there's there's some political space for yeah. Uh, yeah. conversation in the country. Yeah, you know, talking about uh, Amirjan Kosanov, right? Uh, and he's known a government critic. Why was he allowed to run? I, I would describe this election as, you know, it's sort of a light or poorly implemented version of Russia's managed democracy. You know, they're, they're trying to create some illusion that huh. there is, you know, some competition that is happening here so that you can't completely say, like in previous elections, you know, where Nazarbayev would run against candidates who said that they were voting for Nazarbayev. You know, so you can't sort of, so critics, whether domestic or international, when they call out huh. this election, you know, can't basically be like, okay, you're just running on a post in this stage managed election. It, it's supposed to create some illusion that Takayev, when he does win, he went, ran against someone who was a rival, and that's supposed to lend him some legitimacy for 
you know, what we all assume is, you know, his pretty inevitable victory. And, and I think that's really all it is. I mean, I, I imagine Kosanov is not going to get a lot of official attention. I don't think that a lot of the big media organizations are going to talk about him at all here in Kazakhstan, anything that's state run, anything on television, that which is how a lot of, um, you know, especially the older generation mm-hmm. are consuming their media. So I think he'll, he'll be kind of cut out, but he, he's supposed to be on the ballot just for the sake that they can say that they have someone who's, mm. um, you know, a real opposition figure on the ballot. But he probably knows that, isn't it, knowing Kosanov, that, that the authorities are using his name on the ballot. Uh, then, then why even he's running for it? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a question I'd, I'd like to ask him. Um, I, I'm <laughs> hoping to get down to Almaty um, in, the, in the coming weeks, and hopefully I can tie up with him. I mean, my, my guess is, I mean, it's a tough bargain I, I, uh, for, you know, for people in his position. You either stay out of the process and you're completely cut out, or you can try to join this process, which you view as illegitimate, and still try to, you know, use it as a way to amplify your message and give more, you know, credence to this cause of having, you know, a, a real kind of democratic uh, election. So, mm. um, so Lila, uh, there's a female candidate. On mm-hmm. one hand, it's encouraging to see that a, a female candidate is running for this office. But on the other hand, people have some questions about whether she's a uh, genuine competitor. Yeah, so I'm a feminist, and m- like many people think that if there is a, fe- a female candidate, so all feminists will will vote for her. Mm. But uh, of course, I think that like uh, for this is not that straightforward, and uh, this as much as I know, the female candidate she is not a feminist herself. Like uh, in earlier interviews she gave, she said that leadership is mainly like um, a male thing, not a female one. Hmm. And uh, the party that, um, let's say, forced her to be a candidate, I guess that maybe she was just um, doing that things that she was ordered to do. And uh, of course, in the current situation, it's understandable that It is not a question of uh, whether she's going to be a president or not. She doesn't have this perspective at all. Hmm. It is just, uh, you know, be the part of the game where you just uh, represent your party and uh, this, that you are female makes it the, the, the game spicier, you know, hmm. but <laughs> actually hmm. Hmm. doesn't change the dish at all. And talking about Amirjan Kosanov, he was telling that his um, uh, party was planning first of all like initially to protest the the um, elections but after they thought that they can protest the elections anytime you know uh mm. it's not a big deal but maybe now they have the right time at least to try to be in the elections and maybe all the activism that we have now mm. at least in Almaty and Astana mainly but in other cities too gave hope to Amirjan Kosanov and his uh, colleagues that maybe in many years now there is at least a hope that something can happen mm, <laughs> and mm. that now they should try. Mm. Bruce, it will be interesting to see um, how the, the rest of the candidates will try to uh, differentiate themselves from each other. I'm particularly uh, interested about the path uh, Kosanov will choose. You know, he's seemingly independent, perhaps a government critique, but there's a limit to what you can say uh, about the government. What uh, will you be looking at as the candidates, I believe, uh, is going to kick off their debate, the real uh, campaign next week? Uh, well, you know, for, to his credit, he's trying to show himself as a as a legitimate opposition candidate. He on his Facebook page today, he posted criticism of the Kazakh authorities blocking all these websites mm. today. So, I mean, he has come out as as someone who's taking a stand against the the actions of the government. You know, so that that that's definitely speaks. It, it lends credence to the belief that he is a true opposition figure. You know, again, you you rightly mentioned that how much criticism would he be willing to to make of the Kazakh authorities and the answer is probably not a huge amount because he he would 
there's all kinds of tricks that we've seen in the past, not necessarily in Kazakhstan, but in other countries where you dis- you can disqualify a candidate on a, for a number of reasons. What you know, he's had his signatures checked for his documents to file, but they could decide they were going to recheck that and find that you know four thousand more were dubious or or perhaps outright fakes and disqualify him from the election based on that. So I, you know, it's he's walking a fine line, but he has come out fire you know shooting from the hip as they say, and criticized the government's move to shut down the websites today. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, I also wanted to mention, too, with the only female candidate, Dania Yaspaiva, it is significant that she's from one of the, the three parties that has seats in parliament. So it was it was she's not from some other group that doesn't really have any hand on the power. Not that the Akjol has a huge, huge influence in the country, but at least they do have seats in parliament. So it was kind of a curious move that that was the party that brought her forward. You know, and then we see some of these other people, you know, for instance, um, Amon Gildi uh, Taspikov, for instance, is, is a union guy, right? Mm-hmm. He's the head of the unions out in western Kazakhstan. So clearly the authorities are trying to show that, that the unions, which have been a problem for Kazakhstan for a long time, going, you know, certainly back to Jean Ozen uh, in 2011, you know, that, that they're paying lip service to this idea that they, these people also have their candidate out there. Just And, you know, the Communist People's Party of Kazakhstan, not to be confused with the original Communist Party of Kazakhstan, uh, the you know they have a candidate so if you're uh, you know a hardcore communist older person with live most of your life in the Soviet Union the, the illusion is there that maybe you have a candidate that will speak up for your rights too so they've they've done something to kind of make a selection of candidates that that hopefully Clearly, the authorities are hoping in society someone can find their candidate within this group of seven people somewhere and feel that maybe there's somebody that's representing them. Mm -hmm. You know, these seven people uh, currently on the ballot, their number might increase by the day when people will be listening to this podcast because we are recording it today, uh, which is Thursday. And I believe the registration ends by this weekend, uh, I believe. So talking of Tokayev, just a very quick follow-up question, Bruce. Um, He's clearly Nazarbayev's candidate, but is there anything Nazarbayev is doing to 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 help him uh, well i mean he spoke highly of him with the neuroton mm-hmm. party conference where uh Tokayev was forwarded as the candidate so you know it's well known that nazarbayev supports him i don't think nazarbayev mm-hmm. has to say anything more about this at all okay uh and and i wouldn't expect him to as long as there's protests and rallies i imagine uh the people that are supporting Tokayev and nazarbayev's people have probably already taken a good look at the calendar and and they're thanking the powers that be that there are no more holidays mm. uh, between now and the elections because May 1st and, and May 9th have just provided people an opportunity to come out and, and vent their uh, displeasure with the way things are going. There is one more da- significant date, and that would be or March 21st, because mm. that's the anniversary of the protests over the land privatization deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's not a holiday. Yeah. So. Yeah, kind of important reminder, nevertheless. Okay, so um, I guess uh, we will continue talking about Kazakhstan in coming days. So let's end the discussion here. While doing so, let me take uh, your view on one more uh, point. So um, very briefly, uh, Reid, uh, on on one hand, as we see preparations for the elections are underway. On the other hand, growing uh, protesters are taking the streets. So what will you be looking at as we move ahead in, in days to come? I mean, uh, uh, for me, the most interesting thing I'm going to be following is how these, you know, the activists who have been coming out onto the streets and so far, I think, been quite successful about getting their message, um, you know, out into the country and out Mm -hmm. around the world, you know, how are they going to keep up this pressure? How are they going to continue to innovate? And then also, you know, what, how are the authorities going to respond? You know, so far, they haven't really shown any capability to adapt to this more, you know, savvy, more uh, modern form of activism that is kind of starting to spring up in the country. Um, And, you know, again, if if this starts to be a, a harder crackdown, if this is more people getting put into prison, if it's the use of force, things like that, you know, I think that's the kind of thing that can galvanize more people and can could really backfire and, you know, start Takayev's presidency on a, a pretty somber note. And, you know, I think it's an interesting thing at this moment in Kazakhstan, as we're in the middle of this, you know, I guess the Nazarbayev era is not fully over because he is still really co- controlling the country in, in many ways. But it's sort of the transition to the transition of the, you know, the end of his era in overseeing this country. Mm. And, you know, for most of that era, there's been a, a deference to authority in Kazakhstan. You know, it's quite rare for people to actually come out and protest in the way that they have been here. Mm. Um, but that seems that that deference has sort of gone away. Mm. And, you know, as that starts to slip away, you know, I, I can't imagine that's really going to come back. 
that's not something you can build up. It's sort of, it, there's inevitable changes coming here. I just, it's how the government decides to deal in the in this election and in the coming years, I think will have a big uh, determination about what that future of Kazakhstan will be. Yeah. Bruce, just a very quick point. You know, Reid said, and uh, whatever happens, changes are coming. And earlier, uh, Leila said that regardless of the outcome, this won't be the same election. So what will you be looking at as, as we move ahead with this? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, both uh, both Leela and Reed are right on that. Um, you know, the, the authorities are clearly on the defensive uh-huh. here. And, and how much of this they're going to be able to let go for how long is going to be a real question. And will there be any hint from the Takayev camp that they're willing to make some concessions or speak with some of these people uh-huh. who are expressing their dissatisfaction? Or are they going to simply ignore them and then, you know, order the police to come in and detain them when they get to be too uh-huh. much of a nuisance? I mean, I mean that's, that's going to be, for me, the real key is are they going to make any attempt at all to engage with the people who are showing that they're not satisfied with the way things are going and the way this election and the campaign is taking place. Mm. Okay, very brief note uh, from Leila so that we end the discussion. Yeah, so as I said, in the short term till the elections, we are really eager to be uh, very active. And uh, in these elections, this is not as much as about like results, but this is about the process, Mm. how we'll be involved how will be like a uh, voting hmm. uh, that the even the fact that more people will participate in these elections and uh, more people will be actively engaged in watching the elections so this is like a very huge leap for us as a as citizens of the country in a long term i think that this is a challenge a call for us uh, for citizens of kazakhstan is to learn what is it to be a citizen hmm. you know we lived in an authoritarian country where nobody taught us what is it to be an active citizen to be active in the politics in the government like or to have this perspective to be elected in local government or in the country you know and uh, i guess that in the long term we should learn like how to vote how to actively participate in politics how to be citizens of the country and of course not only change the candidates that we will have in further elections but to change all the system to reform all the system of uh, like elections and of uh, governing the mm. country mm. Leila, the way you speak it makes me wonder whether you have a political rule in mind when time is right in kazakhstan uh, there is a thing that uh, it is fun that many friends of mine they like say okay let's vote for you mm. but the thing is that personally i uh, do not have any political ambitions okay. now mm. but it is really important for me to have this choice and to have this perspective that I can be elected mm. or I can vote for the candidates that I want to vote. Yeah. This is, I guess, more important for me now, like oh. in a broader sense. Okay, okay, terrific. Thank you, Leila Zulika Mahmoudova, political uh, activist uh, based in Almaty. Also, big thanks goes to Reid Standish, Nur Sultan based journalist working for uh, foreign policy, Bruce Panier, the editor of for your Play the Central Asia Block Schlock Awazi. Thank you, colleagues, for your thoughts and time today. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, Thank you. for Thank having us. Thank you. It was great to have you. So this is it from me, Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis podcast. Until next week. Bye bye.